Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing another episode of our Anzu Deep Dive. Now we've just been through the coral reefs that we've been through just in the last episode and then we're going to this open area of water that represents probably the open ocean. Now we'll be moving on. It was a very fun episode, now we're moving on to see what's coming next. So now we'll just head through this big ass triangle and make our way through. fish. I think we'll start off with the sunfish down there. Let me just pull up my references. There we are. We'll go find and swim with it. What a big beautiful fish. Now these are called the ocean sunfish or the mola mola. These are the heaviest bony fish that are known to be uh, living today. They reach about between 247 and a thousand kilos. So that's a ton of fish, literally. <laughs> and they're found all across uh, of the world. They can be found in any tropic or temperate waters eating things like uh, jellyfish that's one of the things they specialize in eating and they have these really fat uh, really weird flat laterally compressed bodies which means they're flattened on the uh, uh, lateral plane which means they're front so they've got very skinny bodies very not very wide very skinny and they uh, use these two big fins on their sides to help them swim about and do their thing they don't just eat uh, jellyfish though, they also eat a lot of uh, sculpts and eat a lot of fish eggs. But they're often predated by uh, sea lions and killer whales and sharks. And even by people, like places in Japan and Taiwan, they tend to like, uh, they're considered a delicacy, so often they are hunted for uh, food. And they're frequently caught in gill nets, which is a lot of these happens to a lot of species on this list, and is really bad for depleting their numbers since they're such slow breeders. They can get up to like uh, 3.2 meters in height, so basically the top, bottom from the top, and they get about three and a half meters tall. So that's a pretty big fish, I would say so myself between uh, 1,100 kilos. And for some reason they lock, completely lost their uh, tail fin, pretty much. It, they only have a very small tail fin which, and then they use the big flimps, flippers to propel themselves. Very slow swimmers, they tend to like, plot along about 3 kilometers an hour. And they never dive usually more than 600 meters. But they can move fast if they need to escape predators, like most things do. And they spend most of their time usually hanging out in the depths under, like around 200 to 600 meters, looking for whatever jellyfish and food they can find. Now, if I'm found in warmer waters, not extremely warm, like uh, warmer than 10 degrees, and if they stay in waters much uh, warm, cold, warmer or colder than that, they tend to die just because their body doesn't like the, it's like the optimum body temperature that they like to move around at. 
believe it or not, these little babies, if you see like a... They produce about 300 million eggs in one go. And then the little hatch, hatchlings are only about two and, a half, two and a half millimeters long and weigh about a... Weigh about a gram. So they grow like exponentially, many millions of times bigger before they reach their full adult size, which is really, really, really weird. And they're actually are quite common in captivity. There's some like the Monterey Aquarium that have been holding them. They have a 290 kilo specimen. And even though they're not readily bred, it's just because they're so big, they require a lot of space and a lot of aquariums don't have the space to hold them. So there haven't been a lot of breeding efforts, but they are doing okay in aquariums. But they are very beautiful and interesting fish and definitely worth having a look at. So next we'll move on to Hammerhead. Let's move on to a Hammerhead. Let's see if we can find a reference for a Hammerhead. There we are. We're moving over to a Hammerhead. See some sheep heads again. Let's see if we can follow this up. We are. Come on, let us hang out with you. Our scallop heads, uh, scalloped hammerheads, are a species of hammerhead shark that are not. They're a very big species, but not as big as the great or uh, smooth hammerheads. Well, there's the quarters, the bronze uh, or kidney headed uh, hammerhead shark. And live in waters around uh, all over the world from latitudes 46 to 36 and up to depths of about 500 meters or 1,600 feet down and are the most common of all the hammerhead species and they often get to about uh, between one and a half to 1.8 meters long basically four foot to uh, four foot nine to five foot nine and weigh about 30 kilos when they obtain sexual maturity and the big females can get up to two and a half meters or eight feet and about 80 kilos so they get a little females get a little bit bigger probably due to needing to have more resources to take care of young and like produce young so the biggest one that's been caught is about 43 4.3 meters long and weighs about 152 kilos and there was a female that has been measured at 3.26 and weighed 200 but was gravid which means she was pregnant so that probably put up her weights a little bit and they also have a very high metabolism so that means they have to eat a lot and very active hunters and they're very they like to swim around uh, they're considered a coastal pelagic species which means they like to hang out in open waters near the coast not in the deep deep ocean and if, uh, often found in waters over the 500 meters deep but very often mostly around 25 so they like hanging out in the twilight uh, not twilight uh, Top a bit of the water, the top 300 meters. That's where all its light. And when they are babies, they tend to hang out in sheltered areas like bays and mangroves, where there's high nutrition and there's easy uh, protection from predators and lots of food to eat. So they grow up. And actually, they do a, one of a f few schooling sharks, which means they like to go around and school with each other and swim around the ocean and schools of up to like a uh, huge numbers hundreds or more which is useful for hunting like bait fish and for protection from other larger predators because there's always safety numbers and believe it or not they are uh, uh, often move around at night and they are able to like move around the ocean like with almost a ridiculously good memory and they very good at uh, schooling as well they never bump into each other which is very very cool and they tend to live in uh, deeper water to uh, stay safe from other predators and to find food 
and even though they have a high metabolic rate, they can be sedentary and just do their own thing, let the uh, currents carry them and do to where they go, they just survive. So look, he's now hunting with them, they're just hanging on. And they uh, eat basically just anything they can find, like uh, sardines, mackerel, and herring, and occasionally octopus and squid. But the larger ones have been known to feed on smaller species of sharks, like black tip reef sharks. And like other sharks, they've been affected a lot by uh, shark fin uh, soup, uh, which is Dallas Cassi in a lot of Asian countries. So that has really decimated a lot of their populations. So that really have uh, tried to protect them and try and keep them alive for future generations. So I think we'll move on to what else will we move on to? We'll keep the manatees for when we head out of here. We'll see what else we can find. A silky shark, I think we'll find a silky shark. Uh, not quite here yet. They're over here, I can see him over there. The ones that don't look like hammerheads. Find our silky shark. Who doesn't love a silky shark? One thing about this game is that it's using. Uh, you're supposed to play it with a controller. I'm playing it with a keyboard, but it doesn't really bother me much. There we are. sharks, also known as grey whaler sharks, olive sharks, red bed sharks, and have a lot of very common names. It's a common species of shark that's found around uh, in open waters and are very migratory and they tend to live on the edge of continental shelves, about 50 meters or more, so they do like to live in more open water than they depicted in here. They probably would have worked better in the other one, but that's okay. The uh, have a really slender body and get to about eight feet long or two and a half meters. They can be distinguished because they have a smaller dorsal, uh, dorsal fin than a lot of other sharks. And they have very long pectoral fins, which are the ones at the front that look like arms, kind of like their arms that they use to better navigate through the ocean. And believe it or not, they are one of the oceans, since prey is very scarce, they often try and feed on whatever they can, like cephalopods and bony fish, and be known to attack in schools to like try and break up bait balls and such. And, they're of, and they often follow schools of tuna, just trying to pick off the prey that they, uh, that they find. And these species are actually uh, viviparous, like a lot of other sharks, which means they leave their developing embryos in their body with a placental connection to the to the mother. So unlike a lot of other sharks that will have like a, just the yolk sac in them, they actually have a placenta and feed the babies to there, similar to how a mammal would. And they give up to uh, give birth to up to 16 pups, around, usually around the Gulf of Mexico. And then their babies spend their lives pretty small, living in the reefs, surviving as they can, and then they get older, and they move out into the open ocean to find food. And they're very, very, very... Uh, they uh, can be very dangerous, because just because they're quite big and they have sharp teeth, but as long as you uh, avoid diving in areas where they are and use precautions, like uh, 
shark, uh, a lot of shark stuff that is produced, or has been produced, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but there's a lot of shark repellent that have been, uh, well not shark repellent, it's not real, it's all like a Batman thing, <laughs> but there's a lot of ways to avoid uh, getting in the water and avoid shark attacks, so just please don't go diving in with areas with these sharks. Just keep, uh, keep keep away from them. And though these attacks are very rare, obviously, shark attacks aren't a very common thing, but it's just bit better to be safe than sorry. And they're often valued for their meat and their hide, and liver oil and such. Even though they're considered abundant, they are at risk for overfishing like the other sharks on this uh, game because of shark fin soup and obviously bycats and such, which sucks. But which means they are potentially vulnerable to extinction where their conservation status has been changed to vulnerable in 2019, over 2017 I mean, which sucks. I think that's all I can really say about them really. They tend to follow around larger animals like uh, dolphins and try and catch some food off them. Very interesting species, very cool. So I think we'll move on to... Let's see what other species we'll move on to. We have an eagle ray. Let's see if we can find ourselves an eagle ray. Pretty sure that's a hawksbill sea turtle. We already had a look at them. area where we can find it. Golden Trevelli is a good one to look at. Now they're very similar to their close relative, the uh, giant Trevelli. They're just uh, a little smaller and tend to live in tropical waters around India and the Pacific, from South Africa to Japan to Australia, and are uh, often found in shore waters and both reefs, like they live in reefs and sandy areas. They could be easily distinguished because they're a lot more from their giant trevellies because they've got golden lips and they've also got these uh, golden tail f uh, tail fins and such they have a little bit of a different coloration and they're a lot smaller too they've been known to grow about uh, 120 centimeters and about 15 kilos and travel in schools as juveniles but and they often follow large sharks uh, and jellyfish for both protection and to help find find scraps off them and they use their big jaws to suck out prey from the sand or reefs, so they're more like to suck out what they can. And they overeat like crustaceans and mollusks and a variety of fish, just whatever they can get their hands on. And even though they are... They spawn whenever they can, they gather at night different times of the year throughout the area. Oh, there's a manatee. Oh, look at manatees right now. As a we covered that in the last video. There's kelp fish we already covered those in our other video. There we are, golden trailing. There we go, back there we go. They spawn throughout the year, whatever they can, and they're a very popular game fish and easy to take to bait and such. 
are actually very common in Aquaria as well as juveniles. Sometimes they get a little bit too big. They're actually uh, diurnal as well. They tend to hang out during the day and then sleep at night. And they'll look for individual prey on like other species. They try to pick out the nice things to eat as usual. And yeah, very common game fish and very cool little fishing. So I think we'll move on to another boy. So we can else we can find. Oh, zebra sharks are interesting. Now I bet you're thinking, why are they called zebra sharks? They are covered in spots. Wouldn't the cheetah sharks be better? But actually, they get the name because their babies are all black and they have these white stripes going down their bodies and then they grow out of that and then grow into these zebra sharks uh, spotted forms. So they're named because their babies are very striped. So that's how they get their name. And they're from the Indo-Pacific and they live in coral reefs and sandy flats about 62 meters down well, between 0 and 62 meters so they're not very deep diving sharks these adult species uh, adult sharks are very long like this they have a long uh, long caudal fin which is very useful for staying in the s swimming and being able to crawl and well not crawl but very easy for staying low in the water and not needing to swim very fast gets to ambush predators. Got another zebra shark that helps. And they can get pretty big. They reach about, reach about two and a half meters, and they are nocturnal and they spend most of the day sitting on the seafloor sleeping, where they eat at night, where they eat uh, mollusks and crustaceans, small fish, and even possibly sea snakes. They believe. And they're very solitary, but at times of the year they'll get to large seasonal aggregations. So that for breeding, and they are opiviparous, which means they lay several dozen eggs, and they will just anchor them on the sea floor with uh, tendrils, and often actually are very affectionate to people in captivity. Believe it or not, you've seen videos of leopard sharks letting them, or not leopard, uh, zebra sharks, people letting them pet them, and it's very cute. And uh, of course, for those sharks, they are. Why? Oh, this is kind of time ahead. Like a lot of other sharks, they are of course in danger of getting caught and nets and such as usual. They're a very interesting species. Though they like to eat whatever they can. Yeah, very cool little fish. Well not little, they're eight feet long, but very cool species. I would not complain. So now we'll be moving on to see what else we can get. We got a silver sharks. We got a scallop hammerheads. We move on to cow nose rays. Now cow nose rays are very interesting. I have a toy of these. They're, very they're a species of eagle ray from the Caribbean and they found around the Rhystic Atlantic even the United States and southern Brazil and there's a separate subspecies from Australia we don't they don't tell us which subspecies it is of course but very cool species they are very fast growers and males can reach about 89 centimeters long and uh, in width and they get about 12 kilos and females get a little bit smaller about 71 and about 16 kilos they usually breed from June to October in large schools where they gather together and then or spawn and the embryos will go within the mother and his wings are all folked in and then is nourished by the uh, egg yolk and then is born and it's but it's believed to be about a tw 11 to 12 months gestation even though it's hotly debated and they're often born live and then just swim out and do their thing they're believed to live up to uh, is believed to be uh, about four or five years in age usually that's how long they live for but um, there are some kind of, but there have been reports of them living up to 18 and 16 years for 18 for females and 16 for uh, males which is very interesting 
and they feed on oysters and clams and they eat a lot of very hard shell food which is called uh, technically called durophagy which means they eat hard shell things like crustaceans and such where they use to uh, suck out from the water uh, not from the water but from this bottom of the surface they tend to try and suck out whatever hard things they can and you crunch them up and have a good feed and they often migrate from the Gulf of Mexico to Trinidad and Brazil where they follow a migration pattern from the late spring and then they move about, uh, south in the late fall and they believe that's influenced by the orientation of the sun and the temperature as it gets uh, cooler they tend to go down to the tropics And the, uh, with commercial fishing, often the oyster beds that they rely on to feed on is just, uh, gets destroyed, so that it's affected their populations with less food, meaning less animals, sadly. And even though they're very common in aquaria, they're often in touch pools, and people tend to, uh, even though they have their barbs removed, so people obviously don't get stung. You know what happened to Steve Irwin. Though, people got to be careful with uh, touching them obviously in the wild as well because they can be aggressive and will defend themselves if necessary even though they're not exactly um, hunting you it's just a defense thing so yeah that's enough about cow nose ray let's see if you can find their close relatives the well not that close relatives but you can find the eagle ray this one right there like looking at Trevelli. I want to find myself a nice eagle right there we are. Look at you, you beautiful spots. They are found in the open ocean rather than like the other species in like cool, uh, less slightly more coastal areas. They feed on both mollusks and crustaceans similar to Carnos rays and crush them as they can. They don't have quite as many pups as uh, Carnos rays and are a lot more flat and have these rosettes of spots on them, which are very cute. Oh. Excellent clip there. Go back to our eagle ray. See if we can find it. We already had a look at uh, Galbaldi in our other video. These are actually juvenile golden trevellies. That's where they get their distinctive stripes from. It's a young one. It's cuttlefish ruby cover there. Skeleton sharks already cover them. Just cover these cow nose rays. Uh, where is it? I'm gonna look for them. We already covered hawks for sea turtles. There we are, this one. that these fish swim as we talk about them and they get up to 0. Uh, they can get up to 9.1 meters in length that's not the width of them but they have very long tails very interesting fishy yeah and I think that's about it on equal race there's a few different species of them I think we'll move on to what else we can find Shark, we already covered them. I think what we'll do now actually is see, is anything missing? I can't see anything missing. I think we've done all the species in here. But the other species we've already covered in other videos. I think we'll go and do the manatees after we finish this little puzzle that we do here. Go do it. This is how you do it. Let's fix it up. Let's move 
move on to the next area. Just try and do these chains up. We're feeling chained in. Look at this going. Schooling with us. Isn't that cool? the juveniles are Trevally are different from the adult Trevally. You can see them schooling with them. It's amazing how much fish change as they grow. They even change sex. Then we're gonna make our way through here, but first we gotta have a look at the manatees. Who doesn't love manatees? Now, even though these are not species-specific manatees, these, considering the habitat, they are most likely, in the size, they're most likely West Indian manatees, I think. Because there's, because there's three species. There's the West Indian manatee, which is found in the Indian Ocean around uh, Florida and such. There is the Amazon manatee, which is, lives in the Amazon, of course, and the West African manatee, which lives around the Congo and Africa. So I think we'll have to go to the particular species we're looking for. We'll talk about the West Indian manatee, which is the biggest. They get about four meters long. 2.7 to 3.5 meters long. The female, uh, the males get, I think. Yeah, and about six, 200 between 200 and 600 kilos. So that's a half a ton of manatee. And if, if there has been a large one uh, that's been found that's been uh, 1.6 uh, tons and 4.6 meters long, but that's like an exceptionally large individual. And have been estimated to live for about 50 years or more in the wild. And the oldest one, Snooty is 69 years old and considering that they're mammals they have to breathe air just like any other mammal and they give birth to live young which they are one of the few mammals other than humans elephants and pangolins that have their teats on under their front legs so often you'll see these cute pictures of the baby manatees uh, suckling from their mother's teeth that are like almost like chewing on their fin which is quite cute and they actually have a snout here that's a prehensile, which means they're able to use it to manipulate stuff. It's almost like a really short elephant trunk. And funny that, the elephant's closest living relatives are manatees, believe it or not. They're both uh, very closely related. They're both Afrothiers, which are very interesting. Now, these guys are found around Florida, the Greater Antilles, and Central America, out of those areas, in waters about 20 degrees because they're not very resistant to cold, believe it or not. 
they like to feed on these seagrasses and whatever they can. They've ever been known to crawl up on land and try and graze. Not completely, but they just pull out what they can. And they feed on all sorts of stuff, and they even, like similar to elephants, they have teeth that continue growing through their lifetime. So they never, never run out of them. And they are... Uh, they sexually mature at about three or four years old uh, for males, and females usually about three to five. And they... Even though they uh, get sexually mature at that age, they often don't breed until about seven to nine years old. And they live in like uh, herds, similar to elephants. Not quite as socially complex, but they just live in groups. And the uh, larger males often will like don't try and take over, have, take the females, of course. And believe it or not, they have a gestation period of 12 to 14 months, and they give birth to a cut one calf at a time, sometimes twins. And they usually weigh about 70, uh, 70 pounds or 32 kilos, between 27 and 32 kilos when born, and about 4 feet or a little over a meter and a half long, and are very cute. And even though they don't have permanent pair bonds, their mother will take care of the babies for a couple years as they grow up, and they breed every two or three years. So they're not very fast breeding, which means it's very easy for their numbers to uh, die down if excessive hunting. So yeah, you have to be very careful and oftentimes in areas where these live, uh, since they're so slow moving, they're often very uh, susceptible to getting hit by boats and getting chopped by propellers. You actually see a lot of manatees getting like killed or even just barely surviving getting chopped up by a boat propeller and it's very, very sad because they're very adorable animals. How can you not love that chunky face? I just want to hug one. They're so adorable. And actually, they have are so slow sometimes they let algae grow on their back as you can see here kind of like sloths but yeah I think we need to move on now I can't stay in the manatees forever these videos will be three hours long so let's go let's move on see a new species around here these will be uh, lionfish, I think. We'll have to find them. There we are. There's a lionfish. Do you see it? There we are. Now, there's a lot of species of lionfish, so I always assumed that this was a species of uh, the red lionfish, which is a very common uh, fish. It's usually found around the Indo-Pacific, but has been invasive on the east coast of the United States and the Mediterranean because they've been introduced to the pet trade. And they're actually very venomous, so you don't poke their spines or anything otherwise they'll inject the venom into you that could potentially do some damage and they've got the name the lionfish because their long fins make them look like a lion's mane and often get about the adults can get about 47 centimeters in height well in length I mean and they're basically one of the largest species of the, these lionfish and juveniles are usually when they're born uh, two and a half centimeters long they live for about 10 years and uh, produce obviously produce the venom. They reproduce monthly, believe it or not, and are able to quickly make babies. So that means they're very good at replacing their numbers if their numbers are depleted, and very good at being invasive because they're very fast breeding. And, and they're all across the, uh, these areas, like the Eastern Mediterranean and the Caribbean. They're very invasive, so people try to kill as much as they can because they can destroy very fragile ecosystems by beating out native fish and really disturbing the ecosystem so you be careful when you get fish that are not native to your area make sure you never introduce them in, otherwise they can be invasive and really damage the environment so let's carry on with uh, swimming where are we going to now oh wow let me see some more moon jellies I think we'll keep the great white shark facts for the last video Look at you, are you okay? Very beautiful f fish.
just imagine going for a dive. I'd really imagine I'd love to, like, just go and explore the ocean if I didn't need to breathe at all. That would be, like, goals right there. We're moving on. Oh, what's over here? Oh. Now we get to move down here. Let's see what species we'll encounter here. We're about to dive in Splash Now we're moving up Let's go ham, let's go ham, let's go ham. Sharks, and they beautiful. I think we're gonna have to go and talk to a whale shark. There's some sunfish again, and some barracudas. Some of these species were already covered, so it helps streamline the process a little bit. Now let's go talk to a nice, humongous whale shark. Even got some sunfish to his friends. Look at you, aren't you gorgeous? We don't want you. such a big beautiful shark look at you now these are the basically the largest non cetacean in the ocean they get to about on average about 9.8 meters long but and nine tons but there have been reports of specimens that are 18 meters long but have been unconfirmed so about the largest confirmed specimen has been about 12 meters long and it's really hard to measure them just because they uh, often yet either use a dead specimen or measure them from air, which is obviously very hard with no reference. But they're definitely one of the biggest fish in the ocean, getting up to nine tons. And they're found pretty much every, all over the tropics, basically from the Galapagos to New Zealand to basically everywhere. They can pretty much be found in any tropical uh, waters. And sadly, we don't actually know that much about them. We don't even know where they reproduce. They believe they might be around the archipelago, uh, Galapagos Archipelago, around there maybe, but we have no idea where they are breeding. Though we have found a few babies. Now, unlike the basking shark, which we visited earlier, these are giant filter feeders that they open their mouths, something like that, and just filter out small fish and zooplankton and whatever they can filter in from uh, the ocean and eat that all up. Very, very chill species. They actually are very chill. They do not pose any danger to humans other than being so ridiculously huge. So a lot of people do organize like diving with them. And it's really cool to see people interacting with them because they're just so majestic. And even some fishermen in some areas like a Taiwan and such actually uh, have kind of trained them. They can put water out in the fish and water, sh uh, water out, fish out in the water. And then these whale sharks will come to them and start feeding. So they're very interesting species. They're not since they're so big, not very many aquarium hold them. Like the only really ones that have been successful are the Okinawa Aquarium, the Oscar Aquarium, a lot in China, and there's one in the, the Georgia Aquarium. That is the only Georgia Aquarium is the only one to house outside of Asia uh, whale sharks. And a very, very, 
very hard to keep just because they're so large and they need uh, very specific food since you need to give them uh, stuff that they can filter. But they're a very interesting species, very majestic as you can see here of course. The only thing is that uh, also shark fin soup also affects them because they're often chopped up and in excessive amounts too and they're very slow breeding as well and you always got to be careful and even the babies are quite cute they're born at about uh, 60 centimeters long and they grow up to these massive behemoths that they become so since they're very slow breeding they're very easily susceptible to changes in their environment and excessive hunting so you got to be very careful about these species and make sure they live for a long long time you should just take a moment to appreciate this magnificent animal that. Okay, now we're going to find the uh, meditation area, find all the extra species that we're missing out on. So we can find it. There it is. Backflip! Choo -choo. Now we've got to look for Trevelli. Now we don't want you. seen you. Here we are. We're not looking for yellow tang. These are yellow long nose butterfly fish. Very similar to other butterfly fish. They just have this very unique pattern obviously. I think the more spiky ones are males or no they're not males they're just putting their fans up. Very interesting to see. Very common in aquariums actually. Found around the Indian Pacific, obviously like uh, Africa, Hawaii, the Red Sea and even the Galapagos. They get up to 22 centimeters long, so not excessively huge fish, but are very territorial and often like to protect their areas when they're actually monogamous, so they are pair well protected in territory where they are make sure they have young. And they've actually been known to communicate through water with uh, acoustics. So they kind of like sing through the water, kind of like uh, whales do, but obviously on a much smaller scale. It's very interesting to see that. And now we'll move on to another species. We'll see what else we can find. I want to find the... The cowfish, they're the longhorn cowfish. They're very, very, very weird, these cowfish. They're a species of boxfish, which kind of look like a puffer fish. They are, have, they're called cowfish, obviously, because these have two long prongs here that make them look like bulls. And they uh, get about 50 centimeters long and are often territorial and often live amongst the sand and uh, live about this up to 50 meters. and. They're omnivores, that means they'll eat pretty much algae, a lot of microorganisms, uh, sponges, and mollusks, and crustaceans, just basically whatever they get their hands on, or their fins on. <laughs> and uh, when they are stressed, they will often secrete a uh, deadly toxin, which is obviously uh, very different from other fish poisons, and it's toxic to uh, boxfish. It's very similar to how sea cucumber toxin works. So it's very interesting for a fish to have that kind of toxin. So yeah, cowfish are very interesting. Let's see what other species we can find. So you can find ourselves a clown triggerfish. similar to reef trunk fish. Mm. I might not be able to find one, but just in case, I will talk about them if I can find a interesting relative unless they're not even in this part of the areas. Oh, 
definitely reef trigger fish. I think we'll try and... I think that might actually be in the caves, so let's move on to the caves. So let's just appreciate these sharks. Aren't they beautiful? So huge. So majestic. Heavens now. the architecture here. What's in here? Well, we can see here some Nautilus. Now, Nautilus are a species of uh, marine mol uh, cephalopods. I was going to say mollusks, but they're not. Uh, type of cephalopod that are very similar to extinct ammonites. And they are basically living fossils. Not really living fossils, but they're basically a last lineage, they're the last surviving members of their groups. They're very interesting. They are filter feeders. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they're filter feeders. And they pretty much use these shells to help control their buoyancy. They have chambers in them which they're able to fill up with water or air and use them to control their buoyancy. Very interesting. They're very nocturnal as well, so they like to come out at night. That's why they're here. Very, very cute species. I see some more unicorn fish up there. They just look like they been... might be a different species, but then. So, Nautilus are very interesting. Obviously, being a simplified, they're very intelligent. The opportunistic predators, actually, I was wrong, they're not felt feeders. I was thinking because ammonites are felt feeders, they're actually uh, predators. They'll eat like hermit crabs and basically just scavenge what they can. And they're very, very uh, common around like uh, the Indo Pacific, is obviously as usual. A lot of these species are. Uh, and uh, very intelligent, sensory like uh, other cephalopods. They never really get past uh, 20 centimeters long, but uh, the larger species gets about 25.4 centimeters in diameter, while the smallest one gets about 16. With a dwarf population that gets about 11. So even though there's Nautilus, there's quite a few different species of them. We'll get a good look at them here. Just look at that. That'd be beautiful just swimming around. So they obviously lay eggs and they spawn once per year, like uh, other cephalopods do. And they have uh, like a special t uh, tentacle the males do to impregnate the females. And they often live for about 20 years, which is pretty long for a cephalopod. Like, even giant squids have only lived for about a year and a half. So that's really, that's really interesting. And they live in very deep ocean. I don't worry about the taxonomy of them. So yeah, that's a very interesting little, little shilly boy. What's in here? I think we need to follow the water. Oh wow, what's going on here? Looks like they're dipping water into the uh, ocean. I'm trying to collect it or somehow, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. the next one, some more cupfish in there. Let's follow the follow the road. Oh wow! Ooh, we get to see our next species. Oh, we already talked about the green mores. Oh wow! Is that what I think it is? That's a silicon, from the looks of it. Let's follow around the silicon. This is uh, coelacanth, 
which is very famous for, believed to be extinct for since the Cretaceous period, but it was found a few uh, years ago at the bottom of the uh, ocean, in the Indian Ocean, which is really, really, really weird. There's two extant species. There's a West Indian coelacanth and the Indonesian coelacanth, which are basically one of the oldest lineages of the bony fish, which were believed to be extinct, but have actually looked like they're doing pretty well, actually. They're basically considered a living fossil because they basically, after the Cretaceous, we have no idea where they went. And it's ridiculous. So how... This is what they look like. They have a very splotchy pattern like that to uh, help camouflage them in the dark. There's quite a few species of them, but most of them are extinct. They're the only ones are alive. They live from like the coast of Africa and Indonesia. It'd be interesting with more discoveries if they find any more living species of coelacanth. And they lay eggs, and uh, they take the eggs take about. Uh, they lay eggs, but they remain inside the female, and often it uh, takes about a year to gestate, and then they hatch out and could be cute little babies, of course. And uh, they have, though they don't have a placenta, the babies have a yolk sac, which the anim uh, animals preserved in, to uh, use it to uh, survive. They eat, eat from it. Let's just look at a particular species. Look at the West, Africa, uh, West Indian silicant, because that's probably the species that this is more likely to be. Discovery was really, really huge. And I think that's about it on silicates. I think we'll move in and look at some other species. See a bonnet head shark there, which we'll get into. Backflips. So now we're going to be looking into. These are different species of clownfish from the other one. They, I did my research and they look like saddleback clownfish, which are not too different from other clownfish. They have the same kind of traits. They have the same social system. It's mainly just the colors that's different. But the, uh, yeah, they live in enemies and they have a very complex social hierarchy where there's a big male and all the females. And then when the big male dies, the largest female takes their place. Very weird and interesting. They're yeah, very not too dissimilar in behavior and such from other species of ammonites. Oh, not ammonites, uh, uh, clownfish, but still very interesting color to see nonetheless. And now that was perfect. I wanted to move on. Here's a bonnethead shark, which is a very small species of shark that is uh, quite abundant in America. And it lives in like uh, darker waters. And it's actually believed to be the only omnivorous shark. So that means it eats a lot of like sea plants and seagrass and such, but also known to eat other things like small fish and stuff like that. And what was weird is that it was believed to be a very basal hammerhead, but it was actually revealed through genetics that it was a very derived one. So it's a, not an ancestral hammerhead, it's a very late hammerhead. And they're a very active shark that lives in about groups of about 15 or more. And uh, though they do eat a large amount of sea grasses, they often eat like other crustaceans like blue grass and shrimps and mollusks, so very interesting. And they're viviparous, which means they uh, live in. No, not they live in. Babies are born. Babies are born, of course, like other species. And they actually believed to have uh, be able to do a process called parthenogenesis, which means they can breed without another male or female. So they're able to like kind of clone themselves. And they're found around the Gulf of Mexico and New England and Brazil. And they like the dark waters. They're often found around the equator as well. We've already done more eels in the uh, last episode. In the episode before that actually. And uh, it is a very, very interesting species, especially since they are liberals. And they don't get very big, they get about three feet long, and the biggest one's about five feet long. And uh, still very cool. So now we'll move on to another one. Let's see what else we can find. There's a couple more species in here. Look at more. Have a look at the clownfish where you can see the banner fish. See more. You see some juvenile uh, I don't know what this is, okay, 
have an iron buffer. I'm gonna have a look at those. I'm gonna have a look at the. Uh, not you. I don't care about you right now. We already talked about you. These are remoras, which are very famous for hanging off uh, larger fish. So they like to, that's why they have that flattened head. They're even called suckerfish. They can grow up to about 110 centimeters long and have that big oval uh, structure on their head so they can stick to larger fish and whales and such and able to uh, follow them and feed off their parasites or even their feces and such. So they're found pretty much in tropical waters and occasionally temperate or coastal waters just depending. But they really lack a swim bladder so they usually rely on these species to suck onto them to be able to dive and stuff. So they're very cool little species. And we'll move on to another one. We'll see what else we can find. There's little ones there are anchovies which we don't need to look at before we cover them. I want to find me a nice uh, sturgeon fish. Not really cooperating with me right now. This one over there. It's a uh, Achilles sturgeon fish. This is a very, very, very cool species of uh, tang, which have these obviously black uh, body with these. Uh, orange highlights on the tail and the back which look really cool and they are a little bit uh, medium size for one they reach about uh, 25 centimeters long and are herb herbivorous which means they eat like a lot of algae and such but they'll occasionally eat uh, they will accept in captivity uh, brine shrimp and such and they're found basically around all of Oceania from Hawaii to even found in Mexico and such so very wide-ranging species not too different from other sturgeon fish but have a very interesting pattern nonetheless so what else we need to cover anchovies there's the little ones of blue streak grass which there. So yeah I think that's about it actually so now we'll move over over to the next Hope you guys like this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe and bye. -bye.